Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, is this what we have waiting for us in the future? As persecution against the church increases, is it going to look something like this? Uh, the main topic of this video, we're going to be talking about that scripture in DNC that talks about, and upon my house shall it begin, uh, because I got a comment on one of my videos and so I thought that I would tackle this and research it, show you what prophets and apostles have said about it. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, by the way, in case you're wondering, these are uh, pictures from a movie called Children of Men. I haven't watched it, but that's where that's where these images are coming from. Okay, so before we get into that topic, I have some updates and uh, just a couple news items. So first, here's the update on the Flood the Earth Challenge. We're at 7,246 copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared. Two new people have joined the challenge, which brings us to 765. So we're trying to get to 10,000 copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared and at least 1,000 people that have joined. So keep it up, everybody. We're doing a great job. Okay, <clears throat> so right now I wanted to give you an update in case you haven't seen this. This is, what, this is basically where uh, the IDF has control of in the Gaza Strip. Uh, it seems like they're advancing closer and closer to the Shifa Hospital, which is basically the command center for Hamas. And um, we had already seen that they had started to come in through these corners and that they had cut off the strip down here, which cuts off the two main roads that go north and south through the Gaza Strip. But now they're starting to, it looks like, advance in this direction of the hospital. So this is from War Mapper on X. Um, I wanted to see what the uh, Institute for the Study of War has. And uh, they actually have it a little bit more like uh, like Israel has made more gains than what we saw on the other map. <clears throat> um, these lighter blue areas, like these kind of ghosted areas right here, um, according to the key, it says those are claimed Israel clearing, which I don't know if like the claim is being made by the IDF itself or somebody else. Probably, probably the IDF. And then I guess they feel more confident about the darker blue areas right here. So it looks like these two areas up here are connected up in the north. And then they have a lot of control down here south of Gaza City. So uh, <clears throat> this is where we're at right now. And then there's Al Shifa Hospital. <coughs> Sorry, in there closing in. And we'll see what happens after that. Um. Right now, there's protests going on in Spain. I don't know if you saw this news, but you may remember that. I don't know. I don't remember how long ago it was, but um, you have a part of Spain called Catalonia. And actually, this was um, where my mission was, was in Catalonia. Okay, so <clears throat> you have Catalonia, which is right here. The capital city of Catalonia is Barcelona. And... Uh, there's a set, there's a different language that they speak over here called Catalan, and there's uh, some regional dialects and stuff like that. But a lot of them view themselves as separate from Spain because of their language and culture. And so just like the Basque up here in the north, uh, they've wanted, to, or some of them have wanted to break away from Spain and become their own country, like Portugal. And um, they're, they they I can't remember when this happened, but they, they had like a referendum and there were leaders and they were attempting to break away from Spain. Well, the leaders got arrested and uh, I guess within the last couple of days, uh, they've been given amnesty. And so the people that are against what happened and the leaders not facing any punishment, I guess, uh, they've come out in force in Madrid and there's this protesting going on. So on my Google Earth, I'm going to try and keep track of whenever there's like large protests or riots or uh, clashes with police. So that's what we have going on right now in Spain. Here's the article. <clears throat> I'll put the link in the description below. I don't really want to get too much into the details. Just want to note that it's happening. And uh, this is what it looks like right here. You have this, people in the streets. They have Spanish flags basically in support of <clears throat> keeping Spain united uh, instead of uh, Catalonia breaking off. Here you can see riot police have been deployed. 
and there's clashes. People are running. All right, that's what's going on in Spain. Uh, this right here, this is in Canada. University of Montreal professor Yanis Arab yells at a Jewish student in Concordia to, quote unquote, go back to Poland. And I don't know if this is a bad word, so I'm not going to repeat it. But I just wanted to show you, you know, more of this, like this persecution against Jews around the world. So here's some like actual, you know, pretty intense persecution. We do receive persecution as a church. I'm sure you've received it <clears throat> maybe at work, you know, being made fun of or, you know, people berating you or getting into arguments with you or whatever. It happens. But so far for the church, I don't think it's ever reached this level where you have like, <clears throat> you know, these like competing rallies and groups of people that, you know, get in these altercations like what you're seeing right here. So is this going to happen with the church and the rest of the world? I don't think so. I don't think so. But the Jews are going through it right now. And this is just one more example. Okay, so um, before we bring it back full circle, I wanted to give you an update. I was trying to keep this. Oh, gosh, dang it. <laughs> thought I had it up. Let me find it. I was trying to keep this spreadsheet where I'm keeping track of all these different disasters and it keeps evolving. Okay. It began with me just trying to track capital cities. I was like, okay, I can track capital cities. Anything beyond that would be too much. But then all this stuff started happening and I was like, you know what? I do want to track more. And so I did. And I went beyond just capital cities and I've wanted to track more and more and more things. And I've realized there may not be too much of a benefit of keeping a spreadsheet for all these things because Google Earth is uh, pretty sufficient by itself. I don't need, it's like, it's kind of like doubling my work if I do the spreadsheet and Google Earth. So I thought I would probably just simplify it going forward and just stick to Google Earth. And if I do it this way, it's much quicker for me to um, update the information, like to put these place marks and then just, it lets you uh, do this little box right here where you can do a little description of why you have that place marker right there. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the date, a basic uh, description of what's going on, and then a link uh, to the source of my information. And I think that's all I'm going to do. That way, I can keep track of uh, any warehouse or... Um, you know, plant that explodes or catches fire I can try and keep on top of as many as I come across and riots and flooding and all that stuff, just as long as I can verify it. It has to be verifiable, but I'm going to go ahead and try and tackle everything with Google Earth. So that's what we're doing moving forward. Okay. Now, <clears throat> is this going to be us uh, in a few years? <laughs> Is this going to be us in a few years? Am I going to find myself in a cage uh, with riot police going around and <clears throat> rounding up people, rounding up members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, putting them in cages, uh, people throwing tomatoes at us? I don't think so. Now, <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about it shall, it shall be, it'll begin upon my house. I got this comment from Karen Lee uh, Fredland, <coughs> uh, on my video called, are we in the red zone? Another bookend. And Karen, I'm not saying that you think this way. I, I'm not saying that this is what you're envisioning. Although I will say if you go throughout the, the LDS second coming community, it feels like there's some people that are genuinely afraid of this. Uh, and I just, I don't think there's any need to be, uh, not that there's not going to be trials and persecution, but, I don't think it's going to get to this level. So let me read what she said. Again, I'm not saying that you think that, Karen, but this is what Karen said. Jared, I don't know if you've talked about this, but a couple of questions. Number one, in the scriptures, the Lord says it will start on his house and go out from there. And I'm wondering, what do you think about that? And what type of persecution do you think the church is receiving now or will be receiving uh, as it's supposed to get really bad in the last days. I mean, we've always gotten some 
persecution, but it's not so bad right now that we can't carry on as far as I know. Maybe it's in some places, but for the most part, I think we're okay. So are we going to have some really terrible things to look forward to coming up? Uh, let me tell you just right now, like I said, I, I don't think so. You know, there's going to be like more opposition. You know, I'm sure that if you have a family member that's fallen away from the church, you get in arguments and fights. I do that with my brother and some others and uh, you receive persecution that way. I don't think it's going to get to the point where people are are in cages or camps or anything like that. I really don't. Um, and I'm going to show you why. It's not just based on my own thinking. It's based on the words of prophets and apostles. In fact, let me, I have a couple quotes pulled up just to explain, um, so I can explain wh why I think that. So for example, the April 2021 General Conference President Dallin H. Oaks, in a talk called Defending Our Divinely Inspired Constitution, said, Our belief in divine inspiration gives Latter-day Saints a unique responsibility to uphold and defend the United States Constitution and principles of constitutionalism wherever we live. We should trust in the Lord and be positive about this nation's future. So, I will take his advice and his counsel that we should be positive about this nation's future. And then there's this one from President Nelson. It's the same conference in a talk called <clears throat> What We Are Learning and We'll Never Forget. And he says, much has happened in the past two years. Some of you have lost loved ones. Others have lost jobs, livelihood, or health. Still others have lost a sense of peace or hope for the future. My heart goes out to each of you who has suffered these or other losses. I pray constantly that the Lord will comfort you uh, as you continue to let God prevail in your life. I know that he is just as optimistic about your future as he has ever been. Now, I'm going to insert my own opinion right here, and I think that's because the second coming is close. Because the second coming in the millennium is going to be an incredible time uh, if you're righteous, if you're a righteous member of the church. It's going to be incredible. I think that's why the Lord is so optimistic about our future. But anyway, later in the talk, he says, The future is bright for God's covenant-keeping people. The Lord will increasingly call upon his servants who worthily, worthily hold the priesthood to bless, comfort, and strengthen mankind <clears throat> and to help prepare the world and its people for his second coming. It behooves each of us to measure up to the sacred ordination uh, we have received. We can do this. And then I have all these other quotes where we are constantly counseled <clears throat> to look to the future with hope. Look, look right here, Henry B. Eyring, October 2017 General Conference. The best days are ahead for the kingdom of God on earth. Okay, so if that's what uh, the general authorities are saying, then how do we explain this scripture? Well, I'll show you and I'll, I'll explain it in their words. Okay, but let me read the rest of the comment. Enjoyed your video. I do agree that time is short and the Lord will be coming sooner than later. He is causing a compression of events with all these disasters happening one on top of another, which is the way I believe he's shortening the last days for us that way, because it will take less time to get through it all. Also, he is hastening his work with all the new temples and new missions and missionaries and everything else that's going on uh, is causing a great hastening. So while, so while all the world is in commotion, sorry, so while all the world is in commotion, the Lord is still moving forward with his work. It's really quite amazing, and we're going to be seeing some great and glorious events, I believe, coming soon. Anyway, let me know what you think of my questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Karen, for your comment, and let's dive into it. So first, uh, let's read. Let's go ahead and let's read the scripture. This is DNC section 112, verses 23 to 26. Verily, verily, I say unto you, darkness covereth the earth, and gross darkness the minds of the people, and all flesh has become corrupt before my face. Okay, so he's saying that presently as this is being written, and this is uh, July 23rd, 1837. Darkness covers the earth, and only those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the description in the chapter heading about the verses that we're reading. Darkness covers the earth, and only those who believe 
and are baptized will be saved. All right, let's continue. Behold, vengeance, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth. A day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation. And as a whirlwind, he shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. Now here's, I think, the key uh, to really understanding this scripture. If you're wondering about what it means, you know, it's starting with, with his house, with the Lord's house. He says, first amongst those, or sorry, first among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. Okay, <clears throat> so this is talking about bringing judgments upon the earth because of wickedness and that it would start on his house, uh, meaning the church, in that it would first be among those people in the church that are not really members of the church. You know, the tares, the, the lookalikes, the counterfeits, the cultural, you know, members of the church. They just go to church for cultural reasons. I would imagine, especially in Utah and Idaho and Arizona and places like that, because uh, there's so many members of the church there. Um, or people that are there because they're predators and they have some kind of interest in being a member of the church. Maybe it's because they married somebody, so they're like, they had to, uh, quote unquote, convert and become a member of the church to marry that person, or maybe financial benefits, or who knows? There's any number of reasons. We talked about, we've talked about this a lot on the channel. So, but this is the key. Now, <clears throat> Let's go ahead and let's read what it says in the Institute Manual. And then after that, um, I have a few quotes from Erastus Snow, Heber C. Kimball, Ezra Taft Benson, uh, Elder Dean L. Larson of the, first, of, the, of the Presidency of the First Quorum of the Seventy, Bruce R. McConkie, and then Neil A. Maxwell. Okay, They, they all cover this uh, scripture pretty well. Okay, so DNC 112, 23 to 24, a day of tribulation. <clears throat> Quote, this proclamation should cause us, even in this day, serious reflection, wrote President Joseph Fielding Smith. Continuing, he says, if darkness covered the earth in 1937, surely it has deepened in its blackness since that day. If that day was a day of wickedness, and the Lord in several revelations testified to this fact, then... It is even more so today. <laughs> and let me just add here from uh, Joseph Fielding Smith's time to right now, even more so than that. It's like the blackest black that you can get in 2023. Continuing, we are called upon to remember that the day would come when peace would be taken from the earth and the devil have power over his own dominions. Surely that day has come. Okay, let me insert something right here. We know from Wilford Woodruff who dedicated the Salt Lake Temple, that in, in 1893, at the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple, he said that the angels described in the book of Revelation that were being held back from bringing the judgments on the earth were released. They were released at that time. And Joseph Fielding Smith has talked about that. So anyway, surely that day has come. We have seen days of weeping and mourning, a day of wrath and a day of vengeance upon the inhabitants of the earth, and yet they will not repent. We have seen this day come speedily as the whirlwind, and yet we, <clears throat> and yet we know that we have not seen the end. There will yet be plagues, bloodshed, and weeping until eventually the earth shall be cleansed of all iniquity. Okay, so this is important. He says that the whirlwind has, has already come. There's, there's already been vengeance and um, all the things described in the scriptures. And there certainly has. We had the American Civil War. We've had all the other wars that have taken place. World War I, World War II. Wickedness has increased. There's been plagues. There's been earthquakes, natural disasters, especially this year. So it's, it's happening. You know, this vengeance, wrath, it's happening right now. Okay, so what about, you know, it shall start upon my house first. We'll get to that. In fact, that's the next section. Upon my house shall it begin. In the same revelation in which Zion was defined, 
The Lord warned the saints that only if Zion met the Lord's qualifications would it, would it escape the judgments that were to be poured out upon the world. If they did not qualify as a Zion people, they had no promise. Severe judgments befell the saints because they failed to build Zion and abide by its laws. This prophetic statement uh, also had reference to future members of the church. Okay, so it seems that <clears throat> it's not necessarily just talking about a future time, but essentially it's already begun. And you can see it in the saints failing to build Zion because of iniquity or because they weren't righteous enough at that time. Okay. President Brigham Young warned, quote, if the Latter-day Saints do not desist from running after the things of this world and begin to reform and do the work of the work the Father has given them to do, they will be found wanting, and they too will be swept away and counted as unprofitable servants. It's from uh, the Journal of Discourses, 18 verses, <clears throat> I mean, page 262. Um, President, President Joseph Fielding Smith pointed out, quote, all these things will be withheld. Okay, <clears throat> listen to this. Listen to it carefully. All of these things will be withheld, meaning like the, the punishments, the vengeance, the wrath, the, de the destruction, the judgments. All these things will be withheld while the nations are being punished if the members of the church will keep faithfully their commandments. Okay, so we're talking about the punishments that are reserved for the wicked, for the nations of the earth, those that are wicked, but also those that are in the church, uh, that, that are, you know, the tares of the church. If they will not, then we have received the warning that we, like the rest of the world, shall suffer his wrath in justice, end quote. President Wilford Woodruff emphasized, quote, Zion is not going to be, be moved out of her place. The Lord will plead with her strong ones. And if she sins, she, uh, he will chastise her until she is purified before the Lord. I do not pretend to tell how much sorrow you or I are going to meet with, are going to meet with before the coming of the son of man. That will depend upon our conduct. Okay. So <clears throat> hopefully this is uh, already kind of clear, clarified it. It has to do with the wicked. Okay, it has to do with the wicked. Um, it's not you as a person that's trying to live a righteous life. You're enduring to the end. It's not a pronouncement that you are going to uh, experience persecution. That That's not what the, this verse is about, that we're reading about. Upon my house shall it begin. It's not in reference to the righteous. It's in reference to the wicked that are in the church. But I have some more to we have some more to say about that as we read uh, these other quotes. So we'll start with um, Erastus Snow, Journal of Discourses seven, and this is on page one thirty B. Now let me say, <clears throat> sorry, I better zoom in a little bit. Well, that's too much. And of course, now I have to find it. Where did it go? Here it is. Now, let me say to all such characters, federal officers, the army, Satan sinner, Jew and Gentile, that instead of being protected in wickedness, they will find the sword of justice that hangs over them will soon fall heavily upon them. And when the and when they least expect it. Do you ask who will who will wield it? I answer <clears throat> the Lord Almighty. He will not always look on and see this land polluted by such curses. And those who have professed the name of Jesus Christ and have had the authority of Jesus and departed, right here, departed from the way of the Lord to pursue covetousness and idolatry will be the first to feel his wrath in the day of the Lord when he, when he was born with them sufficiently. Okay, so it's for those people that fall away from the church or they're in the church, but they're not really uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, the next one, this is Heber C. Kimball. And do you hear it, O Israel? And have you seen it and felt the pangs of war? 
when they have sent their army to this territory, intending to drive us from our homes. <clears throat> As they commenced it upon the house of God, it must go forth upon themselves. For as they measured out to us, it must be measured unto them fourfold. So in this sense, it's like he's saying that it's happened. And he's tying it tying it to this event where the army came to Utah, right, uh, to investigate was, what was going on there. <clears throat> now, I wouldn't say that that's the, the actual, like, fulfillment of it, but... Uh, it could be part of it. And, and I'm basing that on what everybody else has said about this verse. Anyway, continuing, he says, the nations are already convulsed. Not only the United, Sp not only the United States, but many of the European nations are feeling the effect of the judgments of the Almighty. And they will continue to be afflicted more and more until, uh, until the above revelations are fulfilled. There's no evading the judgments of the Almighty. Their only escape is in obedience to the gospel, which <clears throat> to the gospel we have preached. But do they believe what we have said? No, they do not believe a word of it. And therefore, there is there is but little hope in their case. Okay, let's move on. This one is from Ezra Taft Benson, April General, Con April General Conference of 1969. Disharmony of some members. Sometimes we hear someone refer to a division in the church. In reality, the church is not divided. It simply means that there are some who, for the time being at least, are members of the church, but not in harmony with it. These people have a temporary membership and influence in the church, but unless they repent, they will be missing when the final membership records are recorded. It is well that our people understand this principle so so they will not be misled by those apostates within the church who have not yet repented or been cut off. But there is a cleansing coming. The Lord says that his vengeance shall be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth, and upon my house shall it begin, and from my house sh shall it go forth, uh, saith the Lord. First among, among, sorry, first among those of you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me. I look forward to that cleansing. Its need within the church is becoming increasingly apparent. The Lord strengthened the faith of the early apostles by pointing out Judas as a traitor, even before his apo this apostle had completed his iniquitous work. So also in our day, the Lord, has <clears throat> the Lord has told us of the tares within the wheat that will eventually be hewn down when they are fully ripe. But until they are hewn down, they will be with us, amongst us. Okay, so you see how Ezra Taft Benson is talking about that scripture? It's talking about the tares. It's talking about the tares of the church. That essentially, the judgments that are coming on the wicked, it's going to first start with the tares that are within the church. All right, continuing. <clears throat> the hymn entitled, Though in the Outward Church Below, contains this thought. Now, unfortunately, this is no longer in our hymn books, but it is my favorite hymn, even though I don't know how the melody goes. Though in the outward church below, both wheat and tares together grow. Ere long will, Je will Jesus weed the crop and pluck the tares in anger up. We seem alike when here we meet. Strangers may think we are all wheat, but to the Lord's all-searching eyes, each heart appears without disguise. The tares are spared for various ends, some for the sake of praying friends. Others, the Lord against their will, employs his counsels to fulfill. But though they grow so tall and strong, his plan will not require them long. In harvest, when he, when he saves his own, the tares shall into hell be thrown. It's an amazing hymn. I love it. <laughs> um, yes, within the church today, there are tares among the wheat and wolves within the flock. As President Clark stated, the ravening wolves are amongst us uh, from our own membership, and they, more than, we should be careful of them. The wolves amongst our flock are more numerous and devious today than when President Clark made this statement. President McKay has said that the church is little, if at all, injured by persecution and calumnies from ignorant, misinformed, or malicious enemies. 
oh, well, look at that. We're talking about persecution and President David O. McKay, talking about persecution of the church, says that, the ch- quote, the church is little, if at all, injured by persecution and calumnies from ignorant, misinformed, or malicious enemies. A greater hindrance to its progress comes from fault finders, shirkers, commandment breakers, and apostate cliques within its own ecclesiastical and quorum groups. So, if anything, I think that that's probably the persecution <clears throat> that we should be the most aware of. And uh, maybe you already are, because you've, re- you've received it from somebody else within the church, family members, friends. Um, I know that I have. I know that I have. I have. And it's not fun. And it's pretty clear that there's some people that come to the church with uh, ulter- ulterior motives. Um, to the point where it's like, if you give them the benefit of a doubt, but you see how they live their life and, you know, the things that they do, the activities, the entertainment, the way that they speak, um, it's like, why are you still here? It seems like you're pretty, uh, like was just said, out of harmony with the church. Like you're, you're singing a completely different song. (laughs) Um, you know, and whenever you want to do something right, you know, you want to keep the Sabbath day holy, for example, or you don't want to go watch a certain movie or whatever the case may be, uh, they come at you and they accuse you or they, uh, try and persuade you to just go along with whatever they want to do. You know, they try to make you feel bad just all these different things. Okay, so continuing, not only are there apostates within our midst, uh, but there are also apostate doctrines that are sometimes taught in our classes and from our pulpits and that appear in our publications. And these apost well, and not so much anymore because now we have the correlation committee of the church. I don't I can't remember when that started, but I think it was around this time, uh, like in the 60s or 70s. Um, the Correlation Committee checks the <clears throat> doctrinal soundness of church publications. Okay. And these apostate pre- these apostate precepts of men cause our people to stumble. As the Book of Mormon, speaking of our day, states, they have all gone astray, save it a few, who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they do err because they are taught by the precepts of men. All right. So hopefully this is becoming clear, but there's still more uh, to share. So there's there's still a few more things to look at. Um, This is by Elder Dean L. Larson of the Presidency of the First Quorum of the Seventy. The strength of the kingdom is within. Okay. He says, but what kind of kingdom, but what kind of kingdom that is within our own souls? What? But what? But what of the kingdom that is within our own souls. There are evidences that we are not completely free from weaknesses within. Family problems multiply. Divorce becomes more common. Signs of preoccupation with worldly material concerns are apparent on every side. Questionable compliance with principles of trust and integrity in business dealings is too frequent. Courtesy and kindness are too often replaced by abruptness and rudeness in human relations. Growing evidences of promiscuity and infidelity to marriage covenants beset us. While acknowledging that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually, the Lord expressed a reservation about the individual members and explained, for I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Okay, so he keeps, uh, he's said it a couple times now, individual, individuals of the church. Okay, keep that in mind as we move on. At another time, he warned those of his church, behold, he said, vengeance, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, and upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First amongst those, first among those 
um, this is a uh, awkward. Okay, first among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. In this time of impressive church growth, it is well for us to look within our own souls to assess our individual spiritual vital signs. Too frequently, Latter-day Saints of all ages yield to the temptation to explore and sample forbidden things of the world. Often, this is not done with the intent to embrace these things permanently, but with the knowing decision to indulge in them momentarily, as though they hold a value of some kind too important or too exciting to pass by. While some recover from these excursions, an increasingly large number of tragedies occur that bring a blight and a despair into many lives. The cumulative effect <clears throat> of these is devastating. The reverberations will affect the lives of those who indulge, as well as the lives of those who have loved and trusted them in unfortunate and unforeseen ways for indefinite periods of time. As a consequence of these things, humanity slips uh, inexorably to a lower level. The real power and influence in the church and kingdom of God are diminished, and all mankind will inevitably feel the loss. Furthermore, as a collective church, we jeopardize our capacity to merit and claim the pres preserving and protecting blessings from the Lord. So it all has to do with individual uh, worthiness and <clears throat> those individuals that are righteous, that are do doing the best that they can, keeping their covenants, they're going to be protected. They're going to be preserved in large part. But those that are not, even though they appear like they are, but the Lord sees their heart and they know that they're fake and that on the inside is just horribleness, they are not going to be preserved. They're not. And I'm getting the sense that it's probably already started, you know, this vengeance. We don't know the whole story because we can't see people's hearts. We don't know. We may get like the sense of some people uh, that are faking it, you know, but we can't truly judge that because we don't know that person's heart, but the Lord does. And if we had all the data points, if we have every member of the church that's ever been since the beginning, the beginning of this church, you may have had a vengeance that has happened that you don't realize was vengeance. You know, somebody dies from the flu, somebody dies at war, you know, and everybody, you know, goes to the funeral and says nice things about them. But you don't really know where that person stands with the Lord. It doesn't matter if they went, if they went on a mission. It doesn't matter if they were a bishop or a stake president. It doesn't even, even matter if they were an apostle. Like, that's not like a guarantee that that person was a righteous person. Uh, we were just talking about Judas Iscariot, right? And um, <clears throat> anybody, no matter how high up, can fall from grace. So for all we know, maybe a lot of the people that have had untimely deaths or a lot of suffering and then untimely deaths or whatever, maybe it was the vengeance of the Lord and nobody was, nobody was the wiser. You know, he's like pruning... Uh, this family tree within the church, taking the parts that are dead, uh, getting rid of them. And I'm not saying that if you have a loved one that died, my dad passed away uh, before his time. I'm not casting judgment upon him, but I don't know. Who knows? It's between him and the Lord. And that is the same thing with everybody else. So the vengeance may be happening and we don't recognize it because we do not know uh, everybody's heart. Okay, we're in the Millennial Messiah, Bruce R. McConkie. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation. And as a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. There is a certain smugness in the church, a feeling that all these things are for others, not for us. But do not the same hurricanes often destroy the homes of the righteous as well as the wicked? And do not the same droughts, droughts? Do not the same droughts uh, often burn the crops of the saints along with those of the Gentiles? 
Do not the righteous and the wicked often fight side by side in the same wars? And do not atomic bombs fall on the inhabitants of doomed cities? Where, then, shall the vengeance of the last days be found? The Lord says, And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, look, I did it, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. Vengeance is for the wicked, in and out of the church, and only the faithful shall be spared, and many of them only in the eternal perspective of things. Okay? That's a really, that's a pretty profound sentence right there. Vengeance is for the wicked, both in and out of the church, the wicked that are inside the church and outside the church, and for many of them, only in the eternal perspective of things. So, for example, Undoubtedly, there are many righteous people that died in World War I, World War II, um, who, who have died from plagues and stuff like that. So it's hard to know exactly what the Lord's doing because we, we, we don't know his judgment. But he knows what he's doing. And if it was revealed to us, maybe we would see that there's a disproportionately, disproportionately large number of uh, tares that are dying in war or... Um, natural disasters than those that are righteous. Even though some of the righteous still die, it may be that much more of the tares, uh, you know, receive these judgments. Does that make sense? Okay, thus the Lord says to his saints, Hearken, O ye people of my church, saith the Lord your God, and hear the word of the Lord concerning you. The Lord who uh, shall suddenly come to his temple, the Lord who shall come down upon the world, with a curse to judgment, yea, upon the upon all the nations that forget God, and upon all the ungodly among you. The saints in the church and the Gentiles in the world will both be judged by the same standard, the standard of Christ. How can anyone be judged by any other measuring rod? He hath given a law unto all things, and all things are subject to him. Uh, I think that's actually as far as I want to go, but... He goes on to talk about how um, their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain my raiment. And we've covered this before, where essentially that's one of the reasons that he's going to come dressed in red. I think a lot of people think it's because of uh, his own blood that he shed in the atonement. That could be part of it, but like what we're reading right here, and I'm not going to make a whole video out of it. We've covered it before. It's uh, because of the judgments that are coming upon the earth and all those that are that are going to die, the, the wicked that are going to be destroyed. Um, I guess I will read a little bit more. This picture is a familiar one in Israel. The wine is trampled from the grapes in great vats, staining the garments of the laborers as though with blood. But in this case, the second coming of Christ is involved. The one harvesting the crop is the Lord himself, and the wine press is full of the wrath of God. Okay, so anyway, that's it. Okay, so let's move on. Got just two more. Okay, they're both from uh, Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. The first one, April 1988. Is that right? No. The first one, October 1982. Uh, be of good cheer. And this is what he says. In the midst of our afflictions, reassurances will come to us from the Lord and from his prophets, as they did to the Lord's people <clears throat> in another age, when they feared an approaching army, and the prophet reminded and reassured them. And therefore they hushed their fears. Like a like a young Eliza Snow in an ox wagon in the midst of tribulation, we can maintain our perspective about things as they really are, and in her words, to be thankful that we are so well off. Such reassurances and perspective will surely be needed, brothers and sisters, for the Lord has clearly indicated that his purifying and sifting judgment would begin first at the house of God and then proceed outward to the world. 
Just what this sifting will consist of is not now clear. Uh, what special pressures, combined with the ongoing and demanding rigors of taking up the cross daily, we know not. We do not know uh, that the tempter's triad of tools, identified by Jesus as temptation, persecution, and tribulation, will be relentlessly used. Now think about that. When you have somebody that's a terror in the church, <clears throat> someone that's doing it for other reasons, when persecution comes, do you think that they're gonna hold they're gonna hold fast to the iron rod and stick with the church? No, they're gonna leave. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing right now. As the world keeps getting worse and worse uh, when it comes to sin and the different philosophies of men, you see a lot of people that just they can't hold on to the church. The <clears throat> the divide is becoming too great. And you have to go one way or the other. There's not really a middle ground anymore. So um, I think that we've already been seeing persecutions. Uh, and we've had it uh, within the church, like we just talked about, from family members and friends. I know so many people, you guys. I don't know about you. Put it in the comments below. But I know so many people that are so bitter against the church people from my singles ward, people from my mission, people from different wards that I've been in, uh, in family members. You know, they haven't been able to hold on and they've gone completely the other, completely the other way. And then they're so angry at the church, like sometimes to, I think, a ridiculous level where it's almost just kind of crazy. Uh, not with all, but some of them, yes. You know, there's one person, there's one person in particular that, uh, I never would have foreseen this person leaving the church, but they did. Uh, they seemed just really sweet. I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know the story. So to be fair, I don't know the story, but at some point they did leave the church and I'm friends with them on Facebook and they are just like on this campaign to, uh, discredit the church, um, to expose, like, quote unquote, expose the temple and things in the temple. And it's just like, where is this coming from? Like you, cause like, it's not just, it doesn't seem like it's coming from a place of care. It seems like it's coming from a place of revenge or hatred or I don't know, a not, not a good place. Um, so anyway, okay, so persecution and dividing the wheat from the tares. Okay, continuing. We do not know that the tempters try... Oh, no, we already read that. Um, and if the heat from the sun of such circumstances will scorch even a green tree, this heat will be very real. Much sifting will occur because of lapses in righteous behavior, uh, which go unrepented of. Okay, that's that's another reason. Much sifting will occur because of lapses in righteous behavior, which go unrepented of. A few will give up instead of holding out to the end. A few will be deceived by defectors. Likewise, others will be offended for, suffi <clears throat> for sufficient unto each dispensation are the stumbling blocks thereof. A few will stumble because in their preoccupation with the cares of the world, they do not have oil in their lamps. And again and again, those who refuse to eat their spiritual spinach will come off second when they wrestle with the world. Some, because of the scorn of the world, will grow ashamed and let go of the iron rod. A few who have been, oh, sorry, a few who have not been saints, but merely tourists passing through, will depart from the path. A few, failing to be of good cheer, will even charge God foolishly. Surely, brothers and sisters, already too many church members have broken hearts and broken homes because of broken covenants and broken promises. Society's increasing slide toward pleasure-seeking brings our so-called civilization comparatively close to Sodom than to Eden. In our striving to be prepared, therefore, let us be careful to rely on parents, priesthood, and principles, and on scriptures and temples and leaders who lead, who see us through. 
let us not mistake prog program scaffolding for substance. All right, and then this one, April 1988, for I will lead you along. What does he say in here? So let us look at ourselves. For the church, the script, the scripture. Okay, for the church, the scripture suggests both an accelerated sifting and accelerated spiritual and numerical growth. With all its, uh, with all this preceding the time when the people of God will be armed with righteousness, not weapons, and when the Lord's glory will be poured out upon them. And then he cites uh, DNC. 112 verse 25 that's our scripture and then he says the lord is determined to have a tried pure and proven people and there's nothing that the lord thy god shall take in his heart to do but what he will do how can we as individual members of the church survive spiritually if we do not honor our covenants how can we survive spiritually if we break out if we break outright the covenants made at the time of baptism or in the holy temples? How can we be on the Lord's side during the great division if we mirror the the world's materialism and selfishness? Okay, so after reading all that, um, I don't think that this is what's to be expected. Um, I think it more has to do with: Are you ashamed of the church? And are you gonna are you gonna sift yourself out of the church? And there's probably gonna be more and more division. The world is gonna become more and more wicked, and it's gonna be harder for more and more people in the church to stay with the church because they want to fit in with the rest of the world. Um, or they, you know, they might have, well, whatever. We we went over the different reasons that <clears throat> Elder Maxwell went over. So hopefully that clears it up. It's talking about the judgments coming upon the wicked in the church. That's primarily what that scripture has to do with. It doesn't have to do with those that are righteous, you know, upon them first, are there, on the righteous are going to be judgments. No. <clears throat> not to say that there's not going to be trials, but the trials seem like they're mainly to sort the wheat from the tares. And so, yes, uh, you have to experience some of it too, but... If you're true, you're going to hang on and you're going to make it through. But those that aren't are going to leave. And um, and this is all in preparation for the second coming. So um, to finish this up, I've decided that on this spreadsheet where I'm keeping track of uh, prophecy fulfillment, that's originally what this was supposed to be. Uh, just taking all these different scriptures and whenever somebody said that this scripture was fulfilled or this prophecy fulfilled, I've been keeping track of those quotes. I decided to turn this into just a general, uh, just like um, scripture uh, spreadsheet. So the name of it now is quotes scriptures. So I have this, this, uh, these scriptures that we were just uh, going over DNC 112 verses 23 to 26 and all these different quotes that we went over, I'm going to save them here so that if this comes up again, if somebody, you know, leaves a comment or there's an email or whatever, then I can quickly come here and then share those. And then, um, and you, and you should pick them up too, you know, with your own documents that you keep. If you're collecting scriptures, quotes and stuff like that, feel free to, um, come into my spreadsheet and then copy this over onto your own, uh, documents. The link for my spreadsheet is in the description box of every video. That's where you find it. Go to the description box and you'll see the link to my spreadsheet. Copy the entire thing. I don't care. Copy the entire thing so that you have it all. And then you can refer to these things uh, in the future. Okay, well, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.